Hi, it's Matt Thomas here, back on Sonic Academy, and today I'm going to be looking at Waves Factory's new plugin, Echo Cat. So, Echo Cat is a recreation of the Watkins Copycat, which is the world's first portable tape delay. 1958, right through to the 80s and the 90s, even though it was still in production, sold hundreds of thousands of units. Now, you may or may not have encountered them, depends if you're more of a guitarist or not, because they were really primarily made, obviously in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't a lot of synth playing going on, so it was primarily a guitarist effect unit. The guy behind the copycat was Charlie Watkins, and the company was Watkins Electric Music, WEM. You can sometimes find their amps and things on eBay, starting to get nice money these days. Apart from his line of guitar stuff, he also invented the PA. If you've ever been to a gig to see a band or gone to a club, it all comes from Charlie Watkins' first PAs. And people like Bowie and Mark Boland used to go to him and pretty much beg him to invent bigger and better things just so they could be heard. Because frankly, when they started, if you've ever seen the early Beatles gigs, you could just hear the guitar amps and the stuff going through like a dreadful public address system. But those kind of trumpet-like horns, you see it like a country fair. That was what the Beatles were playing through in these theatres. So Charlie Watkins was the first guy to put together what we consider to be the, the modern PA, you know, the speaker stacks and so on. And if you look at the uh, the Isle of Wight festival around the uh, time after Woodstock, there's Jimi Hendrix playing his last ever UK gig on a WEM PA. Another iconic 60s gig, the Stones in the Park, if you look in the background, you'll see this little guy, the middle-aged, bald-headed guy wandering around, and that's Charlie Watkins, the man who put the power behind Pink Floyd, The Who, Fleetwood Mac, and many more icons of the late 60s and early 70s. So that was Charlie Watkins, inventor of the PA, and more importantly for us today, also the copycat. Somebody who I was a massive fanboy of. Back in the 90s, I used to work for uh, Future Music for a while, and I pretty much arm-twisted the editor to let me do a review of Charlie Watkins' new tape delay at that time, just so I could get a chance to speak to him. I even released a record under the, uh, the alias Watkins, because I kind of think he's a bit of a lost legend. Like uh, in America, they make a fuss of uh, Les Paul and all this stuff, and over here we've got this guy who pretty much trailblazed one of the most important parts of sound, the actual kind of creation of PAs and stuff, and nobody knows about it. So, you do now. Let's have a look at his delay. So, in a world of super sexy delays, why are we looking at the Echo Cat, some rotten old guitar pedal? Well, because super sexy delays aren't that sexy. Well, they are, but they can get a little bit too pristine, a bit too perfect, and nobody will ever accuse the copycat of being a bit too pristine or a bit too perfect. Far from it, in fact. So what we're going to do is look through why you would choose to use this piece of venerable recording history to spice up your tracks. And then we're going to look at how we use the Coffee Cat so that you can see where it fits into your music making. First of all, let's have a listen to the beast itself.
Right, so that's Echo Cat. Pretty dirty, isn't it? I think that was the thing I was most surprised by because when I used to have um, a real Watkins copycat, the thing is, everybody says, "Oh, you know, tape delay. It's it's so so characterful and dark, isn't it?" Kind of thing that sort of go drang, drang, but genuinely, my copycat would go drang. Kong. It was just like instant utter destruction, and the echoes were just like, kong, 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 kong. and I was like, "I don't think you're going to get a plugin that does that," but they've they've done that now. Obviously, that was a copycat very much at the end of its life with a tired old tape loop, the head starting to fail. They weren't designed that way. They actually sounded pretty gorgeous when they were working properly. But I think most people who encountered a copycat in the 80s and the 90s were sort of like, yeah, that's, um, that's inverted commas, interestingly lo-fi. I did kind of love it. And the guys who made the Echo Cat here are the same. You know, they say in the manual that they, they initially didn't even bother modeling the mains hum because who wants that? But then realized they kind of missed it. That's the joy of the Echo Cat. It really catches all the failings, all the dirt, all the clatter that made the Copycat a nice thing to work with. So you're going to find all kinds of plugins that will do a sort of softer, warmer, more beautiful delay than this. But I don't know if you're going to find one which really hits that dark clatter the same way. So we've had a play. Let's go through the controls from start to finish. We will begin on the front panel. This. My one complaint, you can't twang this bit. On the real one, you could sort of twang that and the tape loop would come loose for a second and you'd get a whoop on the sound and uh, you can't twang it. So I'm going to make one request. I want to be able to twang that so that the tape here just goes whoop. Not sure you're going to use whoop in your music, but if you do want to use it, that's how it's done. So we need that feature. The Echo Cat has three heads. Some of the later copycats had four, earlier ones may have had less, but you've got three playback heads. So you've got a record head and a raise head. And then you've got one, two, three playback heads, okay. On the original machine, you couldn't change the timing of these. It was simply the time it took for the tape to go round. A full loop created the timing. So essentially the distance between the record head and the playback head gave you one, two, three different times. And you could switch those heads on and off here. So you've got one, two, three, all three are engaged, or you can have just one and two, etc. So to hear this, let's get the, um, the power on. So I'm using that same simple stab sound, so we've got lots of space to hear the echoes in. Okay, so on this front panel, we have input, sustain, mix, output. Input, as you can imagine, simply drives the signal in harder. And if you're pushing the input, you're probably going to want to pull the output down. Really shoving the input and pulling the output back is a kind of more abrasive, saturated sound to the whole circuit than if you run it at a nice kind of zero level. Sustain is basically something we call feedback, typically in a delay. And at higher settings, depending on how we've got the various tonalities and filters and volumes of each head set, at these higher sustains, you can get overloading feedback. Mix is a simple wet dry mix. It's totally dry, fully wet. And that's the front panel. Apart from that, we have a high quality switch it just has an anti-aliasing feature to make sure that the signal remains, whilst dirty in a sort of tape modeling way, clean in the digital way, which it seems a kind of contradiction. So you've got the choice to turn it off if you want to get a bit of minutely anti-aliased sound coming through your tape delay. We have a, a panic. If you're getting uh, too much sustain going on and things are building up on the feedback, just hit that. Panic kills the sound. So we've got in out here. Keep your eye on that because obviously, as I say, if you're hitting it too hard, you can get sort of beneficial overdrive, but if you don't want it, keep an eye on that. Zero is your man, as usual. We've got four buttons, heads, tape, motor, master. Let's run into heads first. So we've got one, two, three heads, and you can see there the little light next to head one is illuminating as we're getting an echo on that tape head. If I turn two on, and there we have that overloading sustain. Because with two heads, that's getting way too much level. And the third head. As you can hear there, each one of the heads has got a very different sound on it. That's kind of how I've set this up. You can have very similar sounds going, but I've created this 
very different tonality on each one and panning so we can hear them nice and clearly. So to take one ahead, they're all the same controls. We have a time and a sync button. So time while we're it's sync mode on, you can see this is off, on. While sync mode is on, the time is all in. I'll just turn the other two heads off. Fractions. Or if we take sync off, we get it in milliseconds. Now maximum delay time, as you can see, is not huge. We're looking like about one and a quarter seconds there. And that is true to the copycat. So this isn't the plugin for your Robert Fripp endless delay experiments necessarily. Okay, so we've got time and sync. Then we have volume, pan, high pass and low pass. So on a per head basis, we can control volume. Pan. And then we have filters for high pass and low pass. We can really shape the tone of each head. So that's how we can get this really interesting multi-tap hit where each echo has its own sound. By using these volumes, the pans and the high pass and low pass. That's the heads page. Moving on to tape, we have a few parameters relating directly to how the original sort of tape sound is recreated. First up is hiss. Now, we've got a volume for the hiss. There's none. Here's a load. There's quite a bit of range in that. Now, currently I'm using the hiss in what's called auto mute mode. That means we only hear the hiss when there's an echo. If I take it off, we just get a constant hiss background. And this is the, the mono and the stereo switch. This isn't to do with the delay, it's simply to do with whether the analog hiss itself is created in mono or stereo. The reason for the choice is the original copycat was a mono effect. So it's actually not correct to have stereo noise, although the difference between the two is incredibly hard to notice. But yes, if you need the sound of the noise to be slightly different on each channel, you've got it in stereo. If you want it to be authentic, it's in mono. Mono, stereo, okay. Catifacts, this is a play on the word artifacts, because it's an echo cat, you see. Right, okay, we've got a couple of things. Wow, which is very slow variations in pitch, and flutter, which is very fast variations in pitch. You might get that from a slightly uneven roller on the tape loop. Now, these aren't huge modulation effects. We've got that later on. They just add a tiny bit of movement into the way the tape's replayed, and that is part of the authenticity of the sound. Just going to make sure we're on nothing on the modulation. Yeah, okay, so. Can you hear a sort of slight jet phaser kind of sound? And if I take the wow off, It's more of a frozen phase. This is really, really tiny stuff, but the wow is just causing very small variations in the pitch and the tempo. Flutter is doing the same, but at a much faster rate. Like a very fast, very mild vibrato. So you can use those to make the tape a little wonky. Then you've got age of the tape. It's nice and clean. And there you can hear the tape itself is a bit dull. And finally, for a really knackered old tape, you're starting to get actual signal loss. And finally, over here, we have loop gap. Now, on the actual tape loop, you would have a tiny gap where the loop was stitched together with a piece of sticky tape. And this would often cause a tiny stutter in the sound. And so you can have, if you wish, zero gap, which is actually unreal. Whereas if you want to have something like a real tape loop, you have to have a tiny little gap. Yeah, there's a tiny little break in the sound. It's, again, these are really, really subtle things to hear, but those all together create the effect of what I had on my copycat, which was a tired tape, a tired machine, loads of noise, and probably not the world's best spliced tape loop. 
Motor. Next page here is we've got hum. Goodness, that was loud. So yes, we've got hum in 50 or 60 hertz. And as with the tape, it can be set to auto mute. So we only. We only hear it as the dry signal goes in. Now, if you write a track where 50 hertz is the fundamental frequency, this is really handy. Otherwise, it does basically come in as a slightly unwanted noise. But the fact remains it is entirely realistic. And part of what, again, makes old recordings so live and interesting is that very quietly in the background, like, say, 60 dB down, you'd occasionally have these just traces of hums that have broken through the noise gates and stuff. Right, very speed. This is smooth. This is the time it takes to change the timing of the head. Now, this is also here. You know, this time, if I switch between them, if the smoothing is set to zero, changes between times are really fast. Okay, you can hear there it really sweeps very fast to the new time. If I make smooth long, You can hear there's more of that sort of as the kind of tempo is changing from one to the other. Now that smooth also applies to a mount here. Very speed is a very slight, like a almost like a swing, but even that's overstating it. I'll, I'll play it to you. So this is straight timing. Okay, now this is running slightly late. And that's rushing slightly ahead. There was a piece of uh, gear many, many years ago, a thing called the Russian Dragon, and it was a rack-mounted piece of kit that listened to the timing of delays or somebody clapping along with the beat or whatever, and it showed you physically if you were rushing or dragging. <laughs> Russian Dragon. Brilliant. So this is essentially a knob that allows you to slightly rush ahead or behind the beat, so you can drag it slightly or rush it. And as you move it, whether it's a quick movement or a fast one, is decided by this smooth here. It also applies to, over here, modulation. We can use a sine wave or a triangle to sweep the pitch of the delay up and down. You hear that now? And the frequency of that LFO is here. Now, as you can hear, that's really wobbly. I can use smooth. So that creates its own very interesting thing. We have a fast, quite deep LFO modulation of the pitch, but it's then being smoothed out. So these four work together in various ways, and smooth also works with head swaps as well in terms of timing. So I'll just roll back that depth. Okay, a master. Now here we have ducking. If we want to, we can get rid of the sound of the delays while the dry signal comes in. So I'll just do that now. Now how fast they come back in is set by the speed. Let's get some more delays in, make it easier to hear. And you can hear there they were quite sort of pushed back whilst the dry sound was going on. But if I make their speed of recovery quicker, they'll jump in between the gaps. So you can hear there at the end with no ducking, the delays slightly swamp the dry, whereas with some ducking and a fast return. we get that more defined kind of riff sound. Now, we can target that ducking to the whole of the stereo signal or just the center. So the stereo setting is a more dramatically noticeable effect. The mid one just creates a bit of space in the center for your riff. Global tone, as we saw with the individual heads, again, we have high pass and low pass and now bass and treble for the sound of the whole echo. A 
And finally, for the output section, we have a control of mid and side separately, which is a lovely thing for a delay. So we can have... Boost the side. Now that boost sound in conjunction with the very strong ducking. That's a very groovy, very powerful sound. And the output can be in stereo, as we've been working so far. It can be put back to mono for the real copycat aficionados. Or we even have a thing called fake stereo. I'll switch between stereo and fake stereo. You'll hear the difference. So a tiny bit of offsetting between the two channels creates that extra width there. That is the Echo Cat. Much closer to the original hardware than I expected, and that's all the recommendation I'm going to give it. It doesn't need any more. If you ever played with the Watkins Copycat and thought, wow, what a lovely thing, and they really are. They're built into a little suitcase. They're all kind of fake plasticky leather and bits of shiny James Bondy steel and plastic grills and everything. So 70s. If you want that, get this. Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate all the support from you guys. If you love this video, then smash a like. And if you want to be notified about new videos, hit the subscribe and notification buttons. Peace.